So hopefully this records better than last time. Some people complain about the lighting and stuff, so that's why I tried to fix that, of course. I couldn't quite fix it. Um, okay, so don't worry about the quizzes, but I'll, I'll have them to you by next week. So today we're going to <coughs> go over the basics of dynamical systems. Lecture two. And this is a review of the basics. So I know some of you haven't had dynamical systems, but you can kind of read up on it in Strogatz. That's a very easy read, so you don't really need too much of a background to read Strogatz. It's true, it's a great book. Hmm? <laughs> it's fantastic. Oh, it's a fantastic book, yeah. It's the best book. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so let's consider this problem. Consider a garden and say there are some number of plants in the garden. So I don't know how to draw plants, but let me just draw them like this. So there, say we have a garden, a small garden, and we have some plants in there. And let x equals zero, so of course this isn't how it works in real life, right? So in real life you have dimensions, you have, um, you have all these parameters that you have to be careful about and later on when you do the math, when you set up the problem, then you do the non-dimensionalization. But in this class, just for the sake of brevity and simplicity, we're going to just consider these as non-dimensional. So let x equals zero represent an empty garden. And let x equal one represent a full or a garden at capacity. So not really full, but it's basically, it has reached its capacity. So let's consider this sort of problem. And suppose that the birth rate is equivalent to the population size. So let's write down what that means. So what does it mean for, if we're going to write an ODE where the birth rate is just dependent on population size, and I'm saying it's equivalent to the population size, then what does that mean for the ODE? dxdt is equal to x. Okay. So x dot equals x, right? So that's what, what that means when the rate of the population growth is equivalent to the population size. But now we're saying it's a small garden. So it doesn't have an infinite space to grow in, right? So let's say that the death rate is equivalent to the square of the population size. So what happens to that ODE then? Subtract minus x squared. So we subtract off an x squared, right? So basically, because of the limited resources, if there are too many, then things are going to die off. So that's the idea. So then, how are we going to, so we have the model here, right? So this is our model. So now that we have the model, how are we going to analyze this model? What do we do in these cases? Um, okay, so how are we going to do that, though? What do we do first? Fixed points. Okay, so we find the fixed points, right? So let's call the fixed points x stars. So what are the fixed points? So it's 0 and 1. 
So those are fixed points. So that's basically saying that if you don't have any plants in the garden, then that's it. You're not going to have it. It, it can't spontaneously grow, right? And x star equals one means that it's that the garden is running at maximum efficiency, right? So the garden has as many plants as it can handle, and because it has so many plants, it has all those plants have a lot of offsprings, so it's running at, at full efficiency. So it's not going to move away from that if x star equals one, right? So that's what the fixed points tell us. So now let's draw what the vector field looks like, and this is a one-dimensional vector field. And let me draw it better, actually. So let's draw it like this, though. Where this is x dot, and this is x. So now we want to draw x dot here. So this is what it's going to look like. Let's say that this is 1. This is 1 half. And this is going to be 1 fourth. Of course, you don't have to draw this perfectly accurately. And our vector, our uh, function, our graph is going to look like this. So we have something like that. So we're not going to allow it to be negative, because you can't have negative population, but we will allow it to be more than full. So we will allow it to be over capacity. So this is what our function f of x equals x minus x squared looks like. So x dot equals f of x. So now what, what can we say, or what, what can we do to this? So we want to include the fixed points first, right? So let me include those fixed points. So let's say that let's draw the unstable as red here. And let's draw the stable as blue. So you'll see what I mean by stable and unstable. Some of you know what I mean by that, but Let's draw the two fixed points in first. So now what do we do once we have the two fixed points in there? Determine whether what is a, what is in, is, is it increasing or decreasing on the okay. side of the fixed points? So it's kind of like what we do in a direction field. So we have to figure out which regions that this is increasing and decreasing. So we have to figure out which regions this x dot is positive and negative. So if you draw the x dot equals f of x here, then you can see it right away. So over here, it's going to be increasing. And then if it's above capacity, then there's overcrowding, so it's going to be decreasing. So we have that. So that's basically how we draw the vector field. Now, what does this tell us, though? So I kind of mentioned what it tells us. So it's going to tell us the stability, right? It's going to tell us the qualitative nature of this system. So when we're in this region here, we know that the population is going to grow. When we're in this region, we know that the population is going to decrease. And it tells us what it grows to and what it decreases to as well. So it kind of gives us all the information we want from this system. Now, I mentioned stable and unstable, so I'm saying that this is Unstable, so what does that mean, though? It goes away. So it goes away from it, right? So a, a fixed point is going to be unstable if you put in a small perturbation. So let's say your initial condition is as close as we want to that fixed point. But then that, that initial condition, starting from that initial condition, that population is just going to grow 
beyond what that initial condition was. So no matter how close we start to zero, it's not going to go to zero, it's going to go away from zero. So that's what unstable means. And stable, so we have a stable fixed point if we make a small perturbation around that fixed point and it goes back into that fixed point. So that means if we start off with, um, with an initial condition as close as we want to that fixed point, then it's going to go back into that fixed point. So that's what stable and unstable mean. So any questions about this so far? So we can do this graphically, but there is a way that we can analyze the fixed points without graphical means. So do we remember how to do that? Take the derivative. So we can take the derivative, right? So let's take f prime of x star. So that's going to be 1 minus 2x star. So what does that tell us about the fixed points? Well, if you plug in the x star values, if it's, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's, <laughs> I forget that. It's greater than 1. Mm, well, we want to plug in the fixed points, right? Plug them in, then if so, yeah. f prime is positive, it's unstable. Yeah, okay, so f prime of zero is going to be greater than zero, so that means it's unstable. And then f prime of one is going to be less than zero, so that means it's stable, right? So we can do this sort of thing, but we have to be careful. So where does this fail? Where does... Zero. Hmm? Hmm? If it equals zero? Yes, so if f prime of x star equals zero, then it fails. So do we remember what these sort of fixed points are called where f prime of uh, x star does not equal zero? So those are called hyperbolic fixed points. And then if f prime of x star equals 0, it's a non-hyperbolic fixed point. So we'll talk about that when we do Peixoto's theorem, and that's going to really come into play at that time. So you can look up all these definitions in Shogad's if, if you don't know them prior to this class. Okay, so that's the first model we want to look at. Now let's think of a more complex model. So let me keep the same sort of framework, except we're going to add an animal in there. So my mom actually had this happen to her. She keeps a garden in the summer, and we had, we had groundhogs uh, one year, so they kind of started eating her plants and stuff. Um, so consider that we introduce an animal and it eats the plants at a one-to-one -one rate. So now, let's start off with our initial model. And let's say, and let y represent the population of the animal. So we're gonna let y represent the population of the animal and we'll start off with our initial model for the plants and then make modifications. So the animal is eating the plants at a one-to-one -one rate, so what does that mean? What are we gonna do to that? So basically by one-to-one, -one, I mean that for every animal, it eats one plant in one time step. That would just be minus y. So it would be minus y. So that's how we, we're going to modify it with that information. Now let's see what else we want to put in. So suppose that the birth rate is equivalent to the population size of the plants, and the death rate is equivalent 
to its population size. So the birth rate for the animal is equivalent to the population size of the plants, and the death rate is equivalent to its population size. So what do we add in there? Hmm? No, so, okay, let, let's think of, so when we're talking about the rates of the animal, what do we want to, what do we want to introduce? Why dot? So why dot, right? So y dot equals sum. And then we say that the birth rate is equivalent to the population size of the plants. So then y dot equals what? Oh, x. So it's going to equal x. And I say that the death rate is equivalent to the population size of the animal. Minus y. So minus y. So that's OEE for the animal. Now, I also say that assume the animal's poop acts like a fertilizer, effectively doubling the plant's growth rate. So what, what happens to that ODE then? It becomes plus 2 times y for x dot? Not plus 2 y. Multiply by 2. Uh, which one? x dot? Uh, not, not all of x dot. So we're only thinking of the birth rate, right? So oh, not y then. Um, no, so we're thinking of the birth rate of the plants. Should be plus 2x right? 2x, not plus 2x, so I'm saying it doubles it, um, so it's so going to be just 2x here, right? Uh, 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 okay. So then we have, so that's our model then. So we've come up with our model. So now what do we want to do? Okay, so I, I knew that was going to be the first thing someone would say. And yes, we do want to find the fixed points. But is there another way we know how, um, how to describe a fixed point? And you've actually mentioned uh, this last class. Um, uh, not specifically, but. Are you talking about the, the uh, null part? Yes. So what are fixed points in relation to, uh, to null lines for those who took OD, or those who took uh, dynamical systems? Intersections. So where the null lines intersect, those are the fixed points. And the null lines tell us something very important. They tell us where either x dot is 0 or y dot is 0. So if we have a curve where either x dot or y dot equals 0, then we know how the vector field acts on that curve. So it tells us something very important, and then the intersection of the null clines are the fixed points. So first you want to find the null clines, because once you find the null clines, you have the fixed points immediately, and you also have some very important lines, some very important curves. So let's find the null clines. So what, what do we want to do first? Set x dot y dot equal to zero. Okay, let's set x dot equal to zero. So what does that mean? What curve does that give us? y equals 2x minus x squared. y equals 2x minus x squared. So we get that. And now let's set y dot equals 0. And that gives us y equals x. So these are our two null lines. So what happens on this null line? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, the vector field. What, what does it look like on that null line? So the motion there is only vertical, right? Because x dot equals 0. And then over here, it's only horizontal, because y dot equals 0, right? So that tells us something very important about what the phase plane is going to look like. So we have these two null points. Now we can find the fixed points. So what are our fixed points going to be? Okay, so 1 is 0, 0 is 0, right? So we said, um, so let's see, if we plug this, so how, how do we find, let me ask you actually, how do we find the fixed points from the null lines? How do you 
you have another kind of fixed points from the null bond. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where, how do we do that? Graph it? No, we don't have to graph it. I mean, we will, but we can find it analytically. Just want to set, set the y value of equal? Okay, so we can just take this, plug it in here, right? So here we get that x equals 2x minus x squared, but that means that x minus x squared, which equals x times one minus x is going to equal zero, right? So then we get x equals zero, but if x equals zero, y has to equal zero. So we get zero, zero. And then if x equals one, so that's another fixed point, but then y has to equal one, so the other fixed point is one, one, right? So that's how we can find the fixed points. So we have the fixed points. Now what do we want to do? So we can't start drawing just yet. I mean, we can, but it's, it's a good idea to get some more information. So what else can we get from this? Determine stability. OK, so we want to determine the stability of the fixed points, right? So we're going to have to find the eigenvalues. So before we find the eigenvalues, what do we want to do? So we need to find the Jacobian, right? So the Jacobian of x star, y star, is going to equal 1. Two minus 2x. Two so over here we get 2 minus, or sorry, it's not negative 2. So we get 2 minus 2x two star. So the Jacobian is going to be uh, f of x. Let's say this is f of x and this is g of x, or uh, f of xy and this is g of xy. So let me actually write this down for those of you who haven't taken dynamical systems. So this is defined to be, and in Calc 3 you saw this, but let me just remind you what it is. Let's say this is f of x, y, and this is g of x, y. Then this is going to be partial f, partial x. This is partial g, partial x. This is partial f, partial y. And this is partial g, partial y. So that's the Jacobian, right? So then we're going to compute this. So we get 2 minus 2x star for partial f, partial x. For partial g, partial x, we get 1. For partial f, partial y, we get negative 1. And for partial g, partial y, we get negative 1. So we have that, right? So let me just make sure it's correct. Yep. Yeah. So now that we have that, we can find our eigenvalues. So we want to take the determinant of this minus lambda i at the fixed points, right? So then we have to calculate the Jacobian at the fixed points. So at 0, it's going to be, this is going to be 2, everything else is the same. And at 1, this is going to be 0, everything else is the same. So now we can find the eigenvalues. So let's go ahead and find eigenvalues. So let's find it for 0, 0 first. So this is going to be 2 minus lambda, 1, negative 1, negative 1. So that's going to equal uh, negative 1 minus lambda. So that's going to equal lambda squared. So then that's negative 2 lambda. That's plus lambda. So that's minus lambda. And that's going to be plus 1 equals 0. So then lambda is going to equal 1 half times 1 plus minus radical 1 minus 4ac. So 1 minus 4, so that's negative 3. So that's i 
radical 3. So that's 1 half times, there's something wrong with this though. I made a mistake somewhere. Let me see where I went wrong. Okay, so we have 2 minus lambda there. That should be a negative 1, but why? Or is that correct? That should be negative 1. So why is it negative 1? Oh, because, yeah, okay. Negative 1 times negative times 2, yeah. Okay, yeah. so yes, that is negative 1. Okay, good. So yes, that should be negative 1, and this is plus minus radical 5 then. Okay, good. So we get that. So that should be correct. And then we compute the second one. So that's 0 minus lambda. So that's negative lambda there. That's 1. That's negative 1. That's 1 minus uh, negative 1 minus lambda. So then that equals lambda squared plus lambda minus 1 equals 0. So then that's going to equal 1 half times negative 1 plus minus i radical 3. So we get that. So those are the two eigenvalues. So what does the first eigenvalue tell us then? What sort of fixed point is 0, 0 going to be? Um, unstable. It won't be unstable. Uh, It'll be a saddle. So it's unstable in one direction, but it's going to be stable in the other direction, right? So it's going to be coming towards the fixed point in one direction. It's going to be going away from it in another direction. So that's going to be a saddle, right? Because this is going to be 1 minus radical 5, which is negative, and then 1 plus radical 5, which is positive. And then what, the, what is this going to be? Stable. So it's stable, and then spiral. it's spiral, right? So this is going to make it spiral around, and this is going to tell us that it's stable. So there are classifications of fixed points in Strogat. So if you haven't seen it before, it's in one of these pages. <laughs> yeah. So he does a very nice job of classifying all the fixed points. So you should know what um, what the eigenvalues say about the fixed points. So know about the classifications of these fixed points. So this is going to be a saddle, and that's going to be a stable spiral. So now what do we want to do? So what other information do we need before we can start sketching the phase plane? Page 137, by the way. Has one. OK, so I'll write that down here. Page 137 in Strogatz? Yeah, there's the graph that you drew for us for, uh, for classification. So I actually met Strogatz one. He's one side. Uh, he's a really cool guy. I have a picture with him too on Facebook. <laughs> okay, so we have these two um, these two sorts of fixed points. Now, what do we want to do? What other information do we need? Hmm? I said, do you want to sketch them? Like, draw like a phase point. So, what other information do we need for that, though? What do we do in the quiz today? So we need eigenvectors. Why do we need eigenvectors? Where is that going to be important? Of? Of the null clients? No, no, not the null clients. So let's think of the saddle. We know that one, one way it's decreasing, one way it's increasing. Oh, yeah, so the eigenvectors are going to tell us that, right? So the eigenvectors are going to tell us where it's going to be tangent 
to it decreasing or increasing, right? And then say it was a stable, uh, stable node, then we would get, say, a fast direction and a slow direction. So it gives us a lot of this information. So that's why eigenvectors are important to find here. However, for um, complex conjugate eigenvalues, they don't really give us a whole lot of qualitative information. So we won't do that for this. But we will do that for the saddle because we need to know where it's coming in and where it's going out, right? So how are we going to find that for the saddle then? So we're going to use, so these are the eigenvectors. And let's just keep it kind of general. So let's not um, do both. We're going to just kind of keep it as plus minus. So we're going to plug this in here. So that's going to give us what? So that's 3 over 2. And then minus plus. So then minus plus um, radical 5 over 2. And then we have 1 here, negative 1 here. And then for the bottom, we're going to have uh, negative 1 and then minus. So negative 3 over 2. And then minus plus radical. 5 over 2. So we have that times V of 1, or V, let's just call it V, times V equals 0. So then, what are our two V's going to be? So let's find the one corresponding to that uh, negative branch, so the stable portion of it. So if it's negative here, what's the sign going to be here then? So it's going to be positive there. So we're going to get 1 and then 3 over 2 plus radical 5 over 2. And then for the negative, uh, for the positive branch, same sort of, sort of idea. So it's going to be 1 and then 3 over 2 minus radical 5 over 2. So we get that. So let's just make sure that's correct. And yeah, that's what I get. So that's going to tell us the direction where it's going to be stable and unstable. So here, the um, stable manifold will be tangent to this. And then the unstable manifold will be tangent to that. So these are, these are going to give us the stable and unstable subspaces. So basically, this is going to be the vector where that stable manifold is going to be tangent. And this is going to be the vector where the unstable manifold is tangent. So that's what that's telling us. So now we have all the information that we need to sketch this. So we're not going to worry about the population going below zero because it can't. So this is going to be y, this is going to be x, and now let's see what we want to do. Okay, so what should we do first? Draw the null points. Okay, so let's draw the null points first. So let's see how I want to draw this. I want to do the sketches of the trajectories in green. So yeah, let's draw the two null clines in black then. So the null clines are going to look like this. Let's say that this is 1 and 
this is one, and then this is going to be two. So then the first null pine looks like this. And then the other null pine is going to look like this. So here's the fixed point. So it's going to look like this. So that's what that's going to look like. And these are the two fixed points. So the intersections are going to be the fixed points. So now what are we going to do? Once we have the null lines. So what do the null lines tell us? Where is vertical and horizontal? Okay. So where are we going to put that in? So which one is going to give us things that are only vertical and only horizontal? Well, uh, the vertical is, is going to be when, uh, when x equals zero or x value equals zero. Okay. So that's going to be this one, right? Yeah. So then we know that this is only going to be vertical, but what do we have to figure out for that? Up or down, or positive or negative. Okay, so we have to figure out if it's up or down, right? We know it's going to be changing at that fixed point. So where is it going to be up or down? How do we figure that out? So I guess I erase the... Uh, if it's... Oh, this is... Mm -hmm. I'm not positive this part. Something that I did in first mm -hmm. 73. But uh, if you take the two equations and then say you one is your overlay, so we use the parabola as our first one, okay. and look at where it overlaps in it. So what's inside the parabola should be facing down, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it should be facing up, correct? Uh, for which one? Uh, so you mean for the line? It's going to start to explain, yeah. So, uh, well, okay, so that's going to be horizontal for, I mean, for the straight line. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. So for I, the parabola. I did that backwards. Oh, okay, that yeah. Backwards. Right. If, if we're doing the parabola, it should right. be the part that's above the line is going up. The okay. other side of the parabola that's on the opposite side below the straight line should be going down. So I kind of erased the, the, um, the field that we had. So the ODEs are, just to remind you, it's 2x minus x squared minus y, and y dot equals uh, x minus y. So you were saying it should be... So if you just take yep. the straight line as your essential x plane, mm -hmm. and then you just see what's above that x line, it should be positive, essentially. Uh, not, not always. Uh, right? Almost every case I did in 473 came out to work. I, I so, talked to DJ about, mm -hmm. about it, so <laughs> he said that it should. Um, is this um, um, just a plot of random va uh, of values? Well, well, not random, but like values that is below that line? And okay, yeah, that, that's a good idea. Okay, sure. So, so go ahead, pick a, pick a, okay, pick a point. So between Okay, point 0.5 and uh, 1.5, I guess, it would be like a value. Okay, it's so value. you're saying if we're at point 0.5 here? Yeah. So then it's going to be point, um, oh, so what's okay, that going to be? Maybe actually I'll find two values, I'm sorry. Um, so. so that's going to be 1 minus 0.25, so that's 0.75. So that's going to be 0.25 and 0.75, right? Yeah. So then we can plug it in here. So then for 0.5, that's going to be 0.5 minus 0.75, right? So if, is it negative or positive? It's going to be negative. OK, so all along here, it's going to be negative, mm -hmm. right? But we can see that from here. So we know that we're on this curve, 
and we have that y dot equals x minus y, right? So then we're on, when we're on this portion of the curve, y is always going to be greater than x. So it's going to be negative. But yeah, that's, that's a perfectly fine way of figuring out where y is greater than x by picking, picking some sort of point and then plugging it in. Of course, you can't always do that because some of the points might be difficult to, to evaluate. But here it's going to be negative. Let's draw the arrows for that null line. And then we should check it here too, but we can kind of see that from this. So when we're on this portion, x is going to be greater than y, so it's going to be positive. So we get that. So now how about the other, the other null line? Okay, sure you can, um, but I mean we can kind of see it from here, right? Yeah. So it, it kind of has to go towards the right, and here it kind of has to go towards the left. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you if you wanted to be perfectly rigorous about it, then you know here that we only have x dot equals 2x minus x squared minus y, and we're going to have y equals x. So if y equals x there, then on this portion it's going to be positive, and on this portion it's going to be negative, right? But we can get some intuition from just by looking at the vector uh, vectors that we've placed already. So it's going to be like this. So we get that. So now what do we want to do? Trajectories. Okay, um, what are the important trajectories that we would like to plot first? Uh, vectors. Okay, so what do we want from the eigenvectors? Like just their direction? Or... Um, okay, um, so what, what, what do they tell us? For the saddle, at least. So they're going to tell us the direction where it's coming into the saddle and the direction where it's going out of the saddle, right? So let's figure that out first. So let me do the stable portion in blue. So where is it coming into the cell? From the eigenvectors. So I should write down that this is stable and that's unstable. So we think of this as x and y, right? So then which direction is it coming into the cell? Is it going to have a greater slope or a smaller slope, the stable portion? So that's going to have a greater slope. So the stable portion is going to have a greater slope, and the unstable is going to have a smaller slope, right? So then we're going to have something that looks like this. So that just gives us the um, the vector where the stable subspace is going to be tangent to, so we're going to have to draw it something like this. So that stable subspace is going to be something like this coming in. So it's going to come in like that. And then we want to draw the unstable portion. So what does the unstable portion look like? So that's going to come in something like this, 
But where does it go? So say we're going in forward time. Into the spiral. So it goes into a spiral, right? Around the other point. So it's going to go kind of like this. So it's going to be like this, right? That's going into that spiral. So now we have all the information we need to plot all other trajectories. So let's plot all of that in green. So let me actually extend this so we can get some better plots here. Okay, so now let's say we start off somewhere here. What are those trajectories going to look like? So we know trajectories can't cross, right? Mm -hmm. So here, it's going to kind of follow that red curve. It's going to look something like that. Now let's say if we're up here, where is that going to go? To zero. So it's going to go like this, something like that. But now here, those plants, or yeah, so that's X. So that's, those plants just die off. So then once they die off, that's a totally different type of system, right? And then we can plot a few more. So we can have things coming from further away, kind of going like this. So we have something like that, right? So this way we know what the type of trajectories are going to look like. I just put in the arrows to complete this. So we should know how to sketch phase planes and we should know what they tell us. So that's going to be important for us. All right, so that's phase planes. So we're done with the main things that I wanted to kind of review. But let's review a few more things. So let me erase this part. So I only have a few more minor things to review and then we can finish up for the day. So let's talk about potentials. So let's recall what potentials are. So let's consider that ODE x dot equals f of x. So what do we think, or how do we want to define a potential for that? So let's think of this as, um, let's see how do we want to think of this. So we can think of it as kind of like a force. So if we think of it like that, how do we want to define a potential for that? So if we think of it as, say, a force, we want to define a potential like this, right? We want to say um, that the potential for the system is v of x such that f of x is going to equal negative dv dx. So that's how we want to define potentials for vector fields. 
And let's just go over some of the properties of potentials. So what do we know about potentials? What happens along a trajectory, let's say? So let's, let's take, um, I don't think anyone's going to care about this. So let's take this, right? If I throw it, what happens? What's happening to that potential energy? So that's, that's in a gravitational field, right? So what's happening to potential energy there? It loses it. Hmm? It loses its potential energy. Loses uh, its... Converts it. Huh? It. Okay, it's what? It Increasing or decreasing? Decreasing. Okay, so it's decreasing, right? So that's an idea about potentials. So let's prove that it's decreasing. So let's do this. So we want to show that it's decreasing along trajectories. So we want to show this. We want to figure out what dv dt is. So what do we want to do first for dv dt? So we know dv dx, so what can we do to find dv dt? dx dt? Um, so what's one of the rules that we learn in, in college? for the C. Chain rule. Chain rule, right? So what's the chain rule for that going to be? dv dt dx dt? Uh, no. dv dt Not dt. Oh, dx? Yeah. So it's dv dx, dx dt, right? But what's dx dt? F of x. So it, it's f of x, but how do we define f of x? Negative dv dx. Negative dv dx, right? So that's going to be negative dv dx squared. So clearly, that's always going to be less than or equal to zero. So that shows that potentials are decreasing along trajectories. So that's a property of potentials. So things go from higher to lower potentials. That's the idea behind potentials. So now that we reviewed that, we can discuss some conservative systems. So what, what sort of conservative system do you, do you know of? What did you learn in 473 about conservative systems? Or outside of 473? Yeah, the total energy. Hmm? Yeah, the total energy. Okay. So what, what sort of system do we know of that's like that? It starts with an H. Hamiltonian systems, right? So that's a special type of conservative system. So the book, or perhaps not this book, I think I got this definition from Mises' book. So he says that a system where there is a quantity that is invariant along the flow. So that's a conservative system. And a special type is a Hamiltonian system, which is a reformulation of F equals MA. But now let's recall when we have a Hamiltonian system. So let's review Hamiltonian systems. So we, do we remember what sort of systems are Hamiltonian? They don't lose energy. Right. So let's write it like this. Say we have a system, x dot equals f of x, y. y dot equals g of x, y. Then we have a special property. So there exists, so that's a symbol for there exists. There exists an H such that partial H partial Y equals F of X, Y, and partial H partial X equals G of X, Y. Minus. Minus G of X, Y. So we have that special property. So 
So those are Hamiltonian systems. So then in a, in a Hamiltonian system, um, the energy H of H equals E of X, Y is going to be conserved. So what sort of system do we know does this? So I know in, in my class we actually drew the phase, uh, phase um, space diagram for this, the phase plane. Pendulum? Huh? Pendulum, right? Yeah. So we drew the pendulum, and what does that, that look like? So it's going to look like this, right? We have, say, um, let me just draw this real quick. So we're going to have a saddle here, right? And we're going to have a heteroclinic cycle. We're going to have centers here. And then we have these trajectories where things kind of just keep going around. So I'm not going to go into detail of this, but we're going to have this sort of system, this sort of phase plane, where the energy along these curves don't change. So it's not going towards any fixed point. But this is not a dissipative system, of course. So this is for the pendulum that doesn't have any drag or it doesn't have any retarding forces. So let's just keep that in mind. And one more thing I wanted to review before we go on to interesting stuff next week is um, ah, flows on a circle. So let me just remind you of what close on a circle R, so we can have this kind of system. Say theta dot, let me just write down what we're doing. So if we have theta dot equals F of theta, then we're going to have a flow around the circle. So can we transform this into a system that we already know how to deal with? A type of system that we've seen in this class. Not, not the exact system, of course. We didn't, we didn't do anything like this, but something that we know how to deal with. So what is a circle? How many dimensions is it? Is a circle? It's not two. It's one, right? It's one because on a circle, so let's draw a circle. On a circle, let's say you're here, you only have one degree of freedom. You can only you can either go with increasing theta or decreasing theta, right? But you can't get off, right? So on on a line, let's say, we only have one degree of freedom you can go up and down on this line. On the plane, we have two degrees of freedom. So a point on a plane can go up and down, left, right. It can move around more than on the line. So a circle is basically like a line, right? So we have one degree of freedom, it's, so it's one dimensional. So we know how to deal with certain one dimensional um, systems, right? where x dot equals f of x. But now, can we transform this system on the circle into a system where x dot equals f of x? So we want to convert this into x dot equals f of x, and sometimes that will make our analysis easier. So I want to go over this because I'll, um, we'll talk about Peixoto's theorem at some point in uh, maybe halfway through the semester. So this is where we'll need to take the circle and then put it into a line to make some analysis easier. But 
if we take the dynamics of the circle and put it into a line, how are we going to do that? So let's take this point again, right? And let's take this sort of uh, trajectory. Uh, okay, let's see. Let's say this is unstable, so it's going like this. So let's just say it has two fixed points. Uh, not quite. You just plot the, you just plot two points on on, on a line and then draw the trajectory. Okay, so what what would what would you want to make this look like? Let's think of it like that. Okay, so you have a straight line and then you have a. Um, a stable fixed point and, and a stable fixed point, then you'll draw lines point towards the stable one. Okay, on so let's. Okay, so let's take a look at this. What do you want that uh, to be on on the Cartesian um, number line? Or on the number line? Um, what's the question? What do I want? So, what, what do you want to define that point as on the real line? Um, zero. Okay, how about that? Pi. Mm, let's not do 2 pi. Let's do, do 1. Okay, let's do 1. We could do 2 pi if we want. Sure. We could. Um, but let's just take it as 1. So, where do you want me to put the unstable fixed point? 0. Um, okay, uh, well, alright, well, sure. Well, we, well, you could put it anywhere in between, right? So like you you could do that too. Uh, okay, but we could put it at 0, sure. Let's, let's put it at 0. Where do you want me to put the stable fixed point? Uh, 0.5. Okay, that, that's fine. It's perfectly fine. You can form, you can uh, come up with a map that does this. Mm -hmm. um, but then what happens? Okay, so let's see. Let's see what happens. So we have that this is going this way, right? Mm -hmm. So that's perfectly fine. How about on the right side of the stable fixed point? It's coming in. Right. So it's coming in. So what has to happen to that? Like unstable. So that has to be unstable, right? Uh -huh. What happened? We have two fixed points now. <laughs> we only had one before. So what do we do? It's going to be, it's going to be n, or infinite, infinite, oh, fixed points and unstable fixed points. Uh, not necessarily. So basically what we want to do is we want to identify 0 and 1, right? So this is exactly like this. As long as we say 0, and 1 are the same point, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to identify 0 and 1. So here, f of 0 equals f of 1. So that's what we want to do. If we're taking dynamics on a line and we want to, uh, or on a circle, and we want to see what they look like on a line. So as long as we identify these two uh, points, then we're fine. Yeah, it's. Uh Suppose you had a length of string, and you wanted to turn that into a circle. What's a sort of a natural way of doing that? Glue it together at the ends to make a circle. Right. That's basically. It. So we're going to go over this when we talk about Peixoto's theorem, and we'll deal with uh, proving the one-dimensional version of Peixoto's theorem. But that's that's why I wanted to kind of go over this. So any questions about reviewing any of this material? So you will have a quiz next week, but again, it'll be a small quiz, nothing too complicated. Um, I'll probably just have you draw a face plane for something. And I think that should be good enough for a dynamical systems review. So any questions? All right, so if there are no questions, then I guess we can go, uh, unless Professor Blackmore has any, no. anything to add. So you guys know how to sort of plot phase plane diagrams using MATLAB, right? Mm, yeah. That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. So make sure you have D field and P plane. So they used to be run on MATLAB, but now they're based off of Java. So even if you don't have MATLAB, you can use that. So make sure you have D field and P plane, and then you can sketch these on the computer. You don't have to do it here.
and you get some really nice curves there. You can identify fixed points, you can find the stable and unstable manifolds, you can find everything. So just search on Google and you'll get it off of, I think, Rice University. All right, so yeah, there are no questions then, and that's it for today. So the, the bullet point was pretty good again. Yeah, that